Hey everybody, my name is Kim Siever. Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm departing from my regular format of expressing my thoughts on the topic in under five minutes. Today, I'm doing a response video. On the 25th of July, 2019, the Lethbridge-based Bridge City News published a video on their YouTube channel titled Gender Dysphoria Explained, Dr. Ann Gillies, Guest. In it, Bridge City News' anchor and news director, Hal Roberts, interviews Dr. Ann Gillies. Anne provides what she calls professional Christian counseling in rural Ontario. She has a PhD in counseling from Liberty University, a private Christian university in the United States. Her PhD research, which was published in 2014, was collecting what she calls the attachment histories of Christian men experiencing same-sex attraction and who are currently attending or have previously attended counseling for same-sex attraction difficulties. She's published no peer-reviewed research outside of her dissertation at a Christian university, certainly nothing on gender dysphoria, so it's curious that Al chose her as the so-called expert in what he referred to on Twitter as a healthy discussion representing both sides of conversion therapy. I'm not sure Hal understands what conversion therapy is. Okay, maybe I actually have an idea why. After all, Bridge City News is funded by the Miracle Channel, a Christian TV station, so it probably shouldn't be that surprising that they're interviewing a Christian pastor who got her PhD at a Christian university interviewing Christian gay men. Maybe Paul McHugh was unavailable. Anyhow, in this video I'm going to review the discussion between Hal and Anne, pointing out problematic things both of them say. I know this is a departure from my usual format, but I hope some people find it useful. Let's get into it. The number of children who believe they have been born into the wrong gender is on the increase. Right from the opening sentence, we can tell that this is going to be a biased interview. And as you will see later, Hal does little to suppress his subjectivity and personal prejudices. Referring to trans people as simply those who believe something is dismissive. It dismisses the reality of being transgender. They assume being transgender is simply just a matter of belief, something akin to thinking it's wrong to put pineapple on pizza. And if something is just a belief, it can change. There are those who believe this is good, but there are also many in the medical community who believe it is a fact very harmful for children. Notice the phrasing Hal used in his attempted objectivity. When referring to trans supportive people, he calls them those who believe this is good. When referring to transphobic people, he calls them many in the medical community who believes it is in fact very harmful for children. He frames those who are anti-trans as being part of the medical community, yet leaves out any mention of medicine when referring to the trans supportive group. This is a great example of the appeal to authority fallacy. He also refers to the anti-trans group as being many, while leaving the trans supportive group uncounted. This implies that more people oppose transness. This is an example of the popularity fallacy. Third, he contrasts the belief on of the trans supportive group with the fact of the anti-trans group, again trying to establish a false sense of authority around which he will frame the entire discussion. And finally, he evokes the word children when referring to the anti-trans group while not mentioning anything about children relative to the trans supportive group. Not only that, but he also depicts danger to those children. This is an example of the appeal to emotion fallacy, and this is just the intro. Our guest today is Dr. Ann Gillies, a professional trauma counselor and author of Closing the Floodgates, Setting the Record Straight About Gender and Sexuality. And here's the book right here. Setting the Record Straight? Oh, we can just imagine what that book is going to say. Actually, let's look at the preface to her book, shall we? The book is about neither me nor my family, although we have lived much of what is described herein. Instead, it comes from the deep burden of my heart for Canada its people, and the crossroads we find ourselves at in its 150th year. The foundation of values and morals that Canadians once thought unshakable has crumbled, much as the levees of Louisiana collapse under the assault of floodwaters from Hurricane Katrina. Actions once prohibited by the criminal code have not only been legalized, but have indeed become unquestionable. Our sexuality is designed for union between a man and woman within the covenant of marriage self-giving and faithfully committed. 
learning and growing together in ever-deepening cycles of love throughout the seasons of our lives. This beautiful ideal of marriage is achievable, it's not out of reach, but it takes work and self-sacrifice, something we are often hesitant to invest in. Yeah, this is not an objective science-based book. Dr. Angelis, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks for having me. So how did we reach this point talking about gender dysphoria? What are your thoughts? Well. Ten years ago, did you ever hear that word, gender dysphoria? No, it's just become a phenomenon. It hasn't just become a phenomenon, or phenomenon to be precise. Trans people have existed for a long time. Just because the term is recent doesn't mean what the term describes is recent. Gender dysphoria was actually gender identity disorder, and it's being rephrased in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it's now gender dysphoria, which is the um, distress. So we're treating the distress. Yes, treating the distress is what we should be doing, isn't it? This seems an odd thing to say at this point. It seems as though she's suggesting that we should be treating something other than the mental anguish trans people experience. Surely she didn't, doesn't think we should just make them all straight again? Or is that what Hal meant by conversion therapy? And so things have just uh, continued at a, a very fast momentum. It's highly funded um, by... Um, special interest groups, right? Special interest groups. Several billionaires are funding behind this. And even pharmaceuticals. Yeah, there's a real push. Wait, what? Special interest groups funding this? Billionaires funding this? Pharmaceuticals funding this? What does this refer to exactly? The gender dysphoria phenomenon Anne referred to? In what way exactly? We're only a minute in and the conspiracy theories have already surfaced. But how did we come to that point where people are self-identifying as another gender? When I was a kid, you know, the boys and the girls, and even if boys wanted to play with dolls, that was fine. But we knew boys were boys and girls were girls. So, because you didn't know any trans people when you were growing up, how that means they didn't exist? This sort of rhetoric frames people being trans as something new, as something trendy. But trans and other non-binary people have existed for a very long time. Two-spirit people existed in the Americas long before Europeans arrived, as did the Samoan Fafafine and the Hijra of the Indian subcontinent. Trans people have even existed for millennia in Europe. Hal's trying to present his anecdotal experience as empirical evidence to support his prejudices. Well, there is a lot of teaching in our school systems and on uh, gender ideology, and so children are hearing at a very early age, in fact, kindergarten, um, that they can be, and they might be even, so it's a suggestive thing, they may be in the wrong body. So if teachers telling children that they can be and might already be in the wrong body is suggestive, does that mean parents and religious people telling children that boys are boys and girls are girls, to borrow hell's phrasing, is suggestive? After all, if children can be influenced by what we teach them about gender identity, then surely that includes teaching them that they are cisgender, that they were born a boy so they must be a boy. Surely dressing our boys in blue, putting toy cars in their hands and telling them to not cry must do something for teaching them what it means to be a boy. Or does influencing our children's gender identity only apply to gender identity we don't believe in? Again, to borrow Hal's phrasing. And so certainly our teenagers have heard that. We have a whole generation that's been hearing those things. So when you put thoughts in a child's mind, um, I mean, especially if you tell a child you can't do that, imagine. Some right. children just have to try it out. Oh, you mean how we constantly affirm society gender norms on our children, which they then try out? Do you think it's just a natural thing for girls to like pink and pretend to be princesses? Is it embedded in their XX chromosomes that girls should be cooks and princesses and seamstresses and teachers and counselors and stay-at-home mothers? Of course children are going to explore their gender expressions they learn. If you grew up in a church that teaches marriages between a man and a woman, you're going to believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, independent of whether that is actually true. And children's brains are still developing, so isn't there a danger? A danger of what, how? This is an example of begging the question. You are assuming a danger already exists, and you are asking your supposed expert to confirm that assumption for you. And you don't even specify what this apparent danger is. You just leave it nebulous. Your Christian viewer can fill in the rest, I suppose. It's extremely dangerous. Right. In fact, um, 
children, absolutely, their brain's developing. And a 13-year-old, for instance, their brain is totally reconstructing at that age. In fact, a, a two-year-old brain and a 13-year-old brain look very similar. Now, don't get offended at that. It's just the reality of our biology kicks in, and the brain has this huge uh, recalibration to grow, grow, grow at that age. So those young adolescents cannot make executive decisions. So all of that to just confirm Hal's bias? You didn't even explain what the danger is. Or did you mean to simply imply that transness in itself is dangerous? So Dr. Gillies, let's talk more about outside influences and how much of a role they really play. They really play? As compared to what? Kind of play? I think it's a tremendous role. I've already addressed this. Each of us is influenced by the things we're taught, whether it's religion, economics, or gender identity. This is not new. It's just how you frame it that seems to appeal with transphobic viewers. And uh, I think there's so much in the school system, and now um, schools are um, having to uh, provide special interest groups. Wait, is she talking about GSAs? Peer support groups are special interest groups? Uh, okay. Are these the special interest groups they were talking about before who are funding the gender dysphoria phenomena? And those groups, um, what we're finding is that children are coming out, adolescents are coming out in clusters as transgender. Clusters? Really? As a parent of three trans children, I have my doubts about this. Even so, is it a surprise to anyone that trans people who attend a peer support group find support to come out as, a tra as trans? Isn't that how it should work? Or should trans people just keep it inside for the rest of their lives? They're, these um, adults or adolescents are often marginalized children to begin with. They have mental uh, disabilities of some kind. Autism is very high on the transgender scale. Like uh, what? Trans people have mental disabilities? Trans people are more likely to have autism? I mean, sure, they kind of do have mental illness. That's what gender dysphoria is. Like there's a correlation. So, yeah. So these are our children who are socially a bit awkward. And so they get invited, which is good, right, into a family, a group, right, that will treat them like family as long as they're complicit to the ideology within that group. Wait, it gets worse? Not only do you think that trans people have mental disabilities and autism, but you equate mental disabilities and autism to weakness. You think trans people make easy prey because they're mentally and emotionally weak from their mental disabilities and autism? Neurotypical people can never be trans, is that it, Anne? Would ne neurotypical people be able to resist the temptations of the GSA? That's what we're finding. Now these young women, and some of them had lesbian tendencies before, they are now those uh, even who were lesbian tendencies tend toward lesbian behavior, um, are actually transitioning into the transgender. The transgender? What? Is this, like, the gay? Let's say this is true. Transness is about gender, not about sexual orientation. Trans people can be straight. They can be gay. They can be pansexual or bisexual or asexual. And lesbian tendencies? What does that even mean? Are you saying that being gay isn't real either? It's just a preference, like whether you like zucchini bread? In fact, uh, the latest stat I read was 37% of uh, lesbian, young lesbian girls are transitioning into transgender. One out of every three lesbians comes out as trans. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd love to see the citation for that claim. There's a whole... Uh, there's a whole momentum here, and it's not good. There's divisiveness even within the culture. Not sure what this means. What is the culture? And what divisiveness? Now, there are also puberty blockers, hormone blockers, and even gender reassignment surgery. And thank goodness. Yes. In Canada? For Abs kids? Absolutely. And the push is to have it younger and younger. Not sure what you mean by it. Have what younger and younger? Blockers? Surgery? And what does younger and younger mean? Are you trying to imply to the viewers that seven-year-olds are having phalloplasty? Are you being vague on purpose so your viewers will use their imagination to fill in the empty spots in your logic? 
here because right now what we're hearing from um, from very progressive thinkers, they call themselves progressive thinkers. <laughs> call themselves progressive thinkers. That's actually kind of funny. It's like people saying heck or darn or using dashes to replace letters in profanity they write. Um, is that children need to get on these puberty blockers, of course, before puberty, because that will help them so that they will not have a, a difficult time transitioning. What happens with puberty blockers, it blocks puberty, so they never go through the natural course of their development. Yes, the point of blockers is to block puberty, which they don't want. If prepubescent children are uncomfortable in their bodies, imagine how uncomfortable uncomfortable they'll be once their bodies start changing and becoming more like the gender they're not. That's a huge contributor to gender dysphoria. It's also why gender dysphoria often presents in adolescence. And it's all based out of fear, like some something's wrong with puberty, you know? Is it a difficult time? Absolutely. It was difficult for every one of us because it's so much transition. But we're so afraid of of going through the transitions of life. We created this culture of fear for children. And I agree that going through puberty can be difficult for everyone, except it isn't the same level of difficulty for everyone. Trans youth have to deal with the difficulties inherent with changing hormones, difficulties even you experienced. Now add on top of that gender dysphoria. It amplifies those difficulties. So while you may have had difficulty as a teenager, it was nothing like what trans teens experience. So some of these hormone and puberty blockers, do they actually help a lot of the children when it comes to maybe depression or confusion in their lives? Confusion in their lives? Again, with the idea that transness is made up. That it's just a belief, just a tendency, just something they're confused about, just something they can change. They don't help with that at all. All they do is suppress the natural development. Bull. That's a load of crap, Anne. If gender dysphoria leads to mood disorders like depression and anxiety and going through puberty amplifies gender dysphoria, then of course blockers will help with depression. This is just utterly false. It's also utterly irresponsible that someone presents themselves as an expert then express a falsehood as fact. People will believe this lie as truth. And what I want to say here and really need to uh, em emphasize that, up until about 2006, Gender dysphoria was extremely rare, extremely rare, 0.003% of young girls, 0.003%, very rare. This is misleading. The statistic you're citing is for trans people who sought transitioning, people who received a diagnosis of what you earlier called gender identity disorder, and were seeking hormone treatment and surgery from gender specialty clinics. Obviously, not all trans people will transition or get a diagnosis, let alone both. And not only that, um, if these ch children were affirmed in their biological sex, they would revert. The gender dysphoria would leave uh, in 88% of girls and up to 97% of boys. That's astronomical percentage mental health. Wise. The problem with desistance research is that it's terribly flawed. First, a diagnosis of gender identity disorder was less stringent than that of gender dysphoria in the DSM-5. This means that these desistance studies included large numbers of children who wouldn't have met the more stringent criteria if they sought diagnosis today. Second, these desistance studies weren't, weren't studying gender identity. Some of the participants in the studies were children whose parents were worried about their gender expression. Boys wearing dresses, for example. Third, some studies classified all study dropouts as the sisters, whether they actually desisted or not. Finally, the more popular studies cited for desistance statistics never studied desistance, but rather predictors of persistence. All those who ended up labeled as the sisters were more likely to indicate, when asked if they were a boy or a girl, that they wished they were the opposite sex. Those who indicated they were the other sex were less likely to desist. You're misinterpreting the data. I have a bachelor's degree. You have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD. Yet it seems odd to me that you can't even look critically at the data of the studies you're studying. You think someone with two graduate degrees would know how to properly interpret data. It's super handy to select data that superficially supports the ideological position you've already taken, especially if you depend on no one fact-checking it for you. So what you're going to see is that these children are now put on puberty blockers instead of affirming their biology. And once they go through that trajectory and go on hormones,
they never have a chance of actually re-identifying in the sense of their biology. They can detransist as that's happening, but they will have lifelong effects. I've already addressed these. So what about rapid onset gender dysphoria? Oh, there we go. Can you explain that to our viewers, what it Absolutely. is exactly? Absolutely. That is a very new category. It's not even in the DSM. It's a new category of children. And so it is uh, predominantly young girls between 15. Now we're seeing younger, 13, I would say, to 24. They are coming out, like I said, in clusters in these groups. So young adolescents. And I said earlier that a 13-year-old's brain is is transitioning and growing in an incredible, um, uh, at an incredible rate, and their thinking gets all distorted. Mm -hmm. And so these are the children that are now coming out as, as, tra um, as transgender, and it's called rapid onset. What? It's not rapid onset gender dysphoria is. Rapid onset gender dysphoria is when gender dysphoria happens suddenly and unexpectedly rather than happening progressively over time. There is no prior, um, no prior condition. They are just coming home all of a sudden and saying, I'm in the wrong body. In fact, this is a girl's, that's what's being documented. So to you, trans people can't identify too young, at three, for example, but they also can't identify all at once either? They can't identify suddenly or gradually? It seems to me that for you, it's transness that's the issue not how old someone is when they first realize they're trans. But I had um, someone um, in, uh, that recently, uh, a father, whose son came home, seven years old, the son, and said, I want to be a girl. And three of my friends also want to be a girl, and you're going to help. This person was in the medical profession, and dad, you're going to help us be girls. Is there a problem here? Yes, there's a definite problem. What are we supposed to do with this anecdote, Anne? Are we supposed to use it to generalize the trans experience? Are we to take this one instance of hearsay and extrapolate it as proof for your position? For all we know, you simply made the story up. Or the person you were talking to made the story up. You made up other things you've said in this interview. And as a father, I mean, how do you even respond to something like that? Well, the first thing and I will would... you be charged as a hate crime? Like, well, here maybe we your go. children are taken away from you? In Ontario, you know? if you do not affirm that child's thoughts, because they're thoughts, and what they're, and their feelings that they may be in the wrong body, there is a chance, in fact, it's happened, that the children can be taken out of your home. Wow. So, yes, that's very dangerous. Wait, did you say your name was Anne Gillis or Jordan Peterson? You won't have your child taken away from you if you don't affirm your child's thoughts. Again, you're just making stuff up. I'd love to see actual proof, not just your unreliable testimony that such things have actually happened. But I would say, as a parent, if a child comes home and says something like that, I would want to know, I would want to have them explain, so what, what makes you believe that this is really happening, that all of a sudden you're you're wanting to be a girl. Is it maybe from another child? Maybe they had a conversation at the playground somewhere? Because a lot you of times want to get kids respect that. the opinion of other kids of Absolutely. a similar age as opposed to their own parents. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, they're hearing all this talk and children get out of class after a gender ideology uh, lecture at seven years old. <laughs> a gender ideology lecture in grade two. Hilarious. And sure loves making stuff up but it's not a lecture, but you know, here's the, the little coloring thing that we're doing today on gender ideology. What is it with you, Anne, and gender ideology? Why the infatuation with this undefined nebulous term? And so-called gender ideology works both ways. Hal's earlier comments about boys or boys and girls or girls it is gender ideology. Christian churches are full of gender ideology. And they're hearing all these things, so of course they're gonna talk and they're gonna question, well, could that be me? Rather than hiding it for the rest of their lives, our society for too long has been built on shaky foundations of rigid and arbitrary gender roles. Having children question gender roles and how they apply it to themselves is a good thing. Children are leaving those classrooms actually and going home very traumatized in tears. So, yeah. You know who else comes home traumatized? Trans children who have to endure the cis-normative language they hear every day, telling them they need to be something that they're not. 
So Dr. Gillies, as a father myself, you know, and for a mother, how do you respond to something like that when your child comes home and says, I want to be a boy or a girl? You know, well, and I believe that I am, and you should support me in this. Well, that's right. So I think you have to just really go really slow with these kids because they're hearing all of these things. And so to be able to help them um, really articulate what's going on because these children have not had um, a diagnosis. A diagnosis of what exactly? Being transgender? Being trans isn't a medical condition. Or maybe you're referring to gender dysphoria, but you can realize you're trans without having dysphoria. Gender dysphoria isn't synonymous with being trans. It's something that some people, some trans people experience, but it isn't being trans in and of itself. Equating transness with gender dysphoria is just another way to perpetuate the myth that being transgender is a mental illness. And if it's a mental illness, it can be cured. Whether you frame it as a belief, an opinion, a choice, a tendency, a trend, or a mental illness, it all comes down to the same thing. You think transness isn't real. You think it's made up and something people can just snap out of. In fact, they are, all these children are self-diagnosing, right? A medical condition, a, th a, a psychological condition, and it is still a psychological condition, even though there's such a push now to have that taken out of the DSM. Called it. Um, because we want to keep all these things uh, moving forward progressively. There is an agenda to do that. Well, we help those who have eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia, mm -hmm. would this potentially be a mental disorder? Or should we maybe encourage and support our children who feel this way? Well, it's still categorized as a mental disorder. And I, I really hope it stays there. Being trans isn't classified as a mental disorder. Gender dysphoria is. There's a difference. Both of you should be ashamed. Um, these children um, are basically being affirmed and told that their self-diagnosis is correct. Uh, we don't do that with eating disorders. We don't do it with body um, identity, dysphoric identity disorder, which is people that want to amputate a limb. Um, and really, it's because they hate their body. Being trans isn't a mental disorder, but I've already said that twice. And when you get into the whole area of transgenderism, the longer she talks, the more transphobic she becomes. Again, with equating transness with ideology. Transgenderism isn't a thing. This is a term the Christian conservative right has co-opted to frame transness as political belief rather than lived experience. Because if it's just a belief, it can change. Which used to be called transsexual. Okay. There is a body hatred. There's all kinds of underlying abuse and different reasons that people behave the way they do. And we're not even allowed to treat those reasons anymore. Wait, are you saying that trans people are trans because they were abused? That abuse turns cis people trans? Is this what you tell your clients? We better deal with this abuse so you don't turn trans. What's understandable, of course, of children, they're trying to find their own identity at the age of five or six, but what about adults who've lived, let's say, as a man or a woman for 50, 60 years and all of a sudden say, you know what, I want to be the other sex. I was actually a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa for 50 or 60 years. How does that happen? Well, you know, I, I want to be compassionate to the people that are experiencing things mm -hmm. like that. Oh, now you want to be compassionate? The entire interview you were being dismissive to trans people and their experiences. Now you want to think of passion. Nice try. And it does happen. So, you admit that adults can be trans, but you think children are just confused. If you really agree that trans people exist as adults and they are, as hell put it, trapped in the wrong body, why not prevent that? Why force them to go through puberty they don't want? Why force them to be in a body they don't want? How is that compassionate? Why wait until they're an adult to show compassion? And I think, when I think of all that, I just think, sorry, this is, I think selfishness, because I, I see what happens. Families are destroyed. Everything collapses. Um, so a man wants to be a woman. He's been married. He has several children. So we just leave everything. And just walk away. We walk away and do what we want to do. Sometimes these women are so, um, they're so, they feel like they have to support this ideology, which I, it breaks my heart because I'm saying, no, say no. We are a family. You made a promise to us to love and care 
for us and to love our children. And so, I mean, I won't get um, checkpoints for talking like this, of course, but it's true. While that compassion was short-lived, why on earth would you get checkpoints for forcing a trans person to be cis? Of course that won't get you checkpoints. See, you're the type of counselor who if a trans youth comes to you, you're going to tell them to stick it out and live as the gender your obstetrician assigned to you and your parents raised you as. But when they come to you 50 years later and they say they can't do it anymore, you're just going to tell them, but you're married, you raised a family, you made promises to be a cis person, live a cis normative life. That's a heavy duty grade of messed up. The LGBTQ2 plus community is very strong. Yes. They're gaining a lot of influence. They have a lot of support, billions of dollars behind them. So where do you think this is going over the next decade or so? Billions of dollars? Hell, you bought into the conspiracy. Wow, that's a really good question. What? Are you high? That's a horrible question. He's supposed to be at least feigning objectivity. You only think it's a good question because he believes the same conspiracy you do. Unless people start raise, rising up, standing up and speaking out, we are in trouble. In trouble? Why? Because people in the LGBTQ plus community are finally enjoying human rights cisgender heterosexual people have had by default for thousands of years? At the same time, the LGBT community as a whole, I believe it's, it's starting to implode. Of course you do. You probably believe the rapture is coming soon too. I also believe there's feminists, both within that culture and without, that are rising up against the trans movement. This is not a pretty thing going on here. Sorry, but TERFs are a minority. Fighting against trans rights is always going to be a losing battle. Opposing others, being able to enjoy the same right as everyone else, will always end as a minority position. And so I think we, as believers, for sure. Ah, there it is. At least she finally admits the bias. You see, this was never about Anne being an expert on sex and gender. It's about her being a Christian. The letters behind her name is just an attempt by Bridge City News to use an appeal to authority fallacy and people who have the ability to help need to continue to love and care for those who are struggling. What? You've expressed the exact opposite. You're encouraging people to dismiss transness. Unless you think telling trans people to be cis is loving and supporting. Now you have someone in your own family who is leading a gay lifestyle and walked away, right? Gay lifestyle? What is that exactly? The way gay people commute to work, or do the dishes, or shop for milk, bread, and cheese, or take their children to hockey practice, or go to the movies? Absolutely, absolutely my eldest son. And there's a long story behind that, but I can't get into that today. But, mm -hmm. um, but needless to say, trauma and abuse. And so um, he was in that lifestyle about 11 years, and came out of that lifestyle. And because he chose, he made some choices, called me and said, Mom, hey, what's going on? I'm having all this stuff, I'm really struggling. And anyway, started therapy, which he couldn't even get now, um, because it was to really address the underlying issues that promote the behavior that he was involved in. And so he's been out of that lifestyle for um, about 10 years. He has married. Whoa, that's seriously messed up. Hey, Hal, remember when you were talking on Twitter about conversion therapy? That's it, right there. That's what Anne's son went through. And that's what people are trying to ban in Canada. Gay people should not be forced to be straight. Are you fine with straight people being forced to be gay? If not, then you should be equally appalled when it's the other way around. Oh, and hey Anne, was your son one of the participants in your dissertation research? Because your language here seems to mirror the language in your abstract. Not everyone that comes out of that lifestyle um, has heterosexual feelings. Again with the lifestyle. That's okay, but you can still come out. Wait, what? You stop being gay, but you can still be gay? How does that even make sense? How are people thinking this is a good interview? Um, and he has married and he has children, and wow. he is happy. He's very happy. You do realize that he can be married and have children as a gay person, right? Dr. Ann Gillies, a professional trauma counselor and author of, here it is, Closing the Floodgates, Setting the Record Straight about Gender and Sexuality, Thanks so much for joining me on Bridge City News. Thank you. Oh my. Well, that was a train wreck. Fallacies, misquoted research, anecdotes, myths from an unqualified expert. This must be one of the worst interviews, if not the worst, I've ever seen from a media outlet. But as I said, this outlet is propped up by a Christian television station. So the material, the person they brought on as an expert, 
and the biased questioning shouldn't be that surprising. Unfortunately, even with the flawed arguments and reasoning, plenty of people will still watch this and believe every word. Those 15 thumbs up aren't from trans supportive people. Anyhow, thanks for watching. I hope you found my responses to the interview to be insightful, thoughtful, and well reasoned, even if they might have been a tad exasperated. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. Please also share my video and subscribe to my channel. I'll be back to my regular schedule on Tuesday.